Welcome to Follow to Lead, where we discover how to listen for and follow God's call so that we might lead others to God. Our shared stories of inspiration from religious leaders and those active in the educational ministry of the church can help you know better how God is calling you and the role passionate Catholic education plays in spreading His message of faith, hope, and love. Now please welcome the hosts of Follow to Lead, Father Randy Sly and Kyle Pietrantonio. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Christ the teacher, teach us to listen. Teach us to do the deep listening to the sounds of our soul, waiting to hear your voice calling us to cast out deeper, to become fishers of men and women, shepherds of souls, to follow your will in order to lead others to the truth, beauty, and goodness only you can offer, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, welcome to Follow the Lead, uh, monthly, uh, actually twice a month now, a journey into the world of Catholic education, and we're exploring what it means to follow God in order to lead others to Him. I'm Father Randy Sly, your co-host. And I'm Kyle Pietrantonio. We've got a great program uh, for our listeners today. We'll be talking with Chris Magruder who's the executive producer of The Veil Removed, an amazing multimedia experience of the mass, showing what we would see if the veil was in fact removed. Chris, who is from Des Moines, Iowa, is a cradle Catholic whose faith really came alive when she was in her 20s. She loves the fact that she's continually awakened to the truths of God as she grows in her Catholic faith. Chris, welcome to Follow to Lead. Welcome, or thank you for welcoming me in. It's fun to be with you guys. You have such an amazing mission. I'm really pleased to be with you and to have any association with you guys. It's beautiful. Well, thank you, Chris. It is really good to have you today. And um, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued. I bet there's this great story behind your awakening uh, that happened. Could you tell us just a little bit about yourself, your growing up years, and then what actually awakened you truly to the Lord? Okay, we only have a little bit of time though, right? (laughs) That's it, yeah. (laughs) Um, Well, I'll just tell you, I was a cradle Catholic. I was born into a pretty strong Catholic family, both grandparents, um, everybody went to church and born into a pretty strong Catholic community, 12 years of, or K through 12 Catholic education. Um, Married my husband after high school, excuse me, college. And then um, we started to have kids got moved down to Texas, uh, went through a powerful program called Christ Renews His Parish, which a lot of your listeners might know about. And that really turned my faith on. I was always somebody who went to mass every Sunday, but I wasn't always excited, maybe even a little bored. Um, But I knew that the Eucharist was real and that that was Jesus. And so I knew I needed to be there. But my faith uh, came even more alive Uh, I got asked to be on a radio show called Catholic Women Now on Iowa Catholic Radio with my now co-host, Julie Nelson. And that was kind of an answer to a prayer because I, my kids were all leaving the house and I really wanted um, the Lord to lead me to something that I could do for him. And so in being asked to be a part of that, I knew that I would learn more about my faith and I would be able to help other people as well. And so it was beautiful because we, of course, would do our own programming about information that we wanted to learn. And I came across a lady named Catalina Rivas who had these beautiful experiences in mass. And um, she wrote a booklet about it. And so we talked about it um, on our radio show. Shortly after the radio show, my co-host and I went to mass. And during the mass at the transubstantiation, my, my spiritual director always says, that's a good time to ask the Lord for something. So during the transubstantiation of that mass, I said, Lord, If everybody knew what was going on behind the veil, nobody would leave your church. And I had something happen to me that's not normal for me, but I heard the Lord say, then show them. And I kind of looked around like, who just said that? (laughs) And um, I heard it again, show them what they would see if the veil was removed. And I immediately leaned over to my co-host who was with me in mass. And I said, I have to talk to you. Following mass, she said she had been praying about the same thing during the transubstantiation. And so one thing led to another, um, immediate miracles started happening. I mean, that day I had a picture in my mind's eye of somebody that we would work with in film. And I knew that he was tall and he was strong Catholic 
and um, that he was not an amateur, that he was a professional and that he'd be really good at what he did. And so fast forward a couple months, um, we had the script written and everything. We went to Spirit Juice Studios, who also works with Bishop Robert Behrens and some other people you guys would know, Scott Hahn kind of people. And um, when they came to the door to let us in that day, Spirit Juice Studios, the person that answered the door was name was Greg. And Greg was the same person that I had in my mind that very first day that the Lord introduced this idea to us. So it was like, whoa, and we just had literally miracle after miracle that have come through this project that has kind of, God has shown us that it is his project and not ours. So it's been beautiful. Uh, that's amazing. Now, the, have you had any video experience prior to, to doing the veil or? <laughs> I had one class in college. I was an English major, but I took a um, broadcasting class just for fun. And so that was about it. And that was in the 80s. So really, yeah. I can't say I had any experience. God just kept putting the right people in our path from anything business related to film related to marketing related. It was, it was really amazing. Chris, we obviously want to talk more about the short film, The Veil uh, Removed, and we'll include a link to it in the show notes uh, to our podcast. But before we get uh, further into that, uh, we'd like to hear a little bit more about your background in radio. Uh, in particular, uh, the program you host, uh, Catholic Women Now. Can you tell us a little bit about that, how that came about? Sure. So like I had said earlier, I was um, kind of coming to the end of my days with raising my kids at home. I was a teacher, but I ended up staying home most of the time that I had my kids. And so as that was coming to a close, my youngest son was getting into his senior year of high school. And I just started praying. I'm like, Lord, all my friends are telling me it's going to be great. I can go play tennis whenever I want and I can go on vacation, but I'm going to have fun doing that for about two weeks. I know that I need something to do. You know, I need something for you to do. And um, so that was really interesting because within probably two weeks, I got a call from my co-host saying, hey, we're looking for somebody to replace our present co-host. And um, both myself and another lady started praying about it. And we both came up with your name separately. Um, so would you be interested in doing this? And I'm like, Yes. And she goes, well, I'll give you some time to think about it. And I'm like, I don't need time. <laughs> this is what I've been praying for. So um, my natural gift of gab has kind of come into play now in my life and being able to be on the radio. We meet um, about a couple times a week to prepare for our radio show. And we interview, we've interviewed so many amazing people from people like Rick Santorum to local people, um, just people doing amazing things around the world. And then we sometimes go unplugged, as we say, and We'll just chat, but we always get to choose what we want to talk about. It's interesting lately, um, just as the world has changed, you know, the Lord has been bringing more conversations about the Holy Spirit and the power of Jesus' name and um, gifts that exorcists bring to us these days. I mean, it just really depends kind of on what's going on in the world or in our own personal lives that we decide what we're going to talk about on our show. So that's how we decided we were going to talk about Catalina Rivas and her experiences and other saints' experiences where they saw the veil removed at Mass. So, yeah. So when you began to think you and Chuli about this, uh, was uh, putting a film together the first thing that you thought about that would you would be doing or? Yeah, I, I knew I, that day when the Lord inspired that in me, I knew that we were supposed to show a short film that sh it was only, I, I don't know why I knew this, but I knew it was only supposed to be three to five minutes and I didn't understand why, but it was supposed to be something that we would show people what you would see if you went into mass and that thin veil between heaven and earth was removed. And so, you know, like some of these saints, you know, you've got St. John Chrysostom, St. Bridget, St. Gregory, St. Augustine, St. Dominic, some big saints who had these experiences as well. But what would it be like if anybody could walk into church and have the veil removed? How would that change your mass experience? I mean, I was the typical person who thought mass was boring and I didn't understand things like the fourth cup. I didn't understand how time broke down and we were literally at the crucifixion and at the last supper and why those two points in time. I didn't understand all that. I didn't understand. I always heard that the mass was the most powerful prayer you could say, but I didn't understand why. And I didn't understand that all the saints, all the angels, all the souls of purgatory, my deceased relatives who are in heaven or purgatory, they're all there. Um, so it all of a sudden, it, it changed the mass for me. And it's been really awesome to see how it's changing other people's minds. I was just at a talk um, in Council Bluffs, Iowa, just this past weekend, and I was talking to about 50 ladies in a rosary group. And I got done, and there were some ladies probably in their late 70s, and they're like, wait, 
I didn't know this information. How come I didn't know this information? I had 12 years of education growing up and now I'm old. <laughs> and I said, I said, you know, I don't think that everybody has known. This is, at least it's new information for me. And you know, I, when we were making the film, our Bishop Pates, uh, Bishop Richard Pates was our Bishop at the time. And, and he said, oh yeah, I knew this. And I said, well, my generation didn't learn it. We got, we lost it somehow. And therefore now our kids don't know it either. And so that's why you hear mass is boring and why people are not coming back to mass. And so one of our goals was really to get young people to understand this so that when they leave home, they choose to continue to go to mass when they go to college. Well, Chris, my exposure to your film was rather providential because our oldest child uh, this school year has been preparing for her first Holy Communion. Oh. And so I was able uh, one morning over breakfast, um, probably the day after you and I initially spoke and, and uh, to share it with her and to see her moved, uh, you know, as, as a seven-year-old girl who, you know, understands um, uh, it as a seven-year-old does, but, but what the film did to actualize it on a whole nother plane for her was really moving as a, as a father. Um, so much so that, you know, she brought it to her class, shared with her teacher, um, and, you know, they all watched it together as a class. And um, so, I, I mean, I get goosebumps sharing that because this is, you know, how it's working, right? And uh, the impact it's, it's having, and it's just really, really awesome. It was so high, so high quality of a film. I'm sure it was not inexpensive to produce yeah. no, it, uh, it wasn't. <laughs> it, that, those three to five minutes took uh excuse me those five minute 23 seconds took about three hundred and thirty thousand dollars, and um we we committed to 310 500 and god bless spirit juice studios they didn't tell us but they came up with the rest of the money from um wow. private donors there to wow we had no idea we one of my board members actually asked them at a party after the premiere of it they said did we pay the full bill? And they said, not quite, you know, kind of thing, but they are amazing people. They have, um, you know, the Eucharist in a monstrance part of the time, but always in their chapel and which is part of their studio. It's amazing. But the people mm -hmm. that they brought in to help us from Los Angeles and um, some of the people that worked on like the special effects were people that worked on a lot of Arnold Schwarzenegger films. And, you know, it's just, we had, we had amazing people working and they were, most of them were Catholic. And the ones that weren't Catholic was really cool because it was such a peaceful experience and everything didn't fall into place. And when it didn't, they were patient and, you know, their virtues came out. And so people that um, were agnostic or called nuns, a lot of them that were in working, they were so amazed. There were some of them that were like, I got to learn more about this Catholic thing. It was just different from any other filming experience that they had had. And so that was really positive. Um, how the Lord even worked just on, you know, the people who are working in the background. And of course, he always does that kind of thing. So nothing goes left untouched by the Lord when you're doing anything for him, really, truly. Oh, so. that's, that is for sure. Now, there, is it about 7 million views? Is that, that I, did I hear that correctly? Actually, now, um, well, they're thinking we're more, we're probably past about 22 million. Oh, my they, word. They can guarantee 10 million, and it's been seen in 93 countries. Wow. We do have 10 translations and we're working, hope, we're hoping to get four more translations and yeah. So okay. we, wow. we want it to be seen by billions of people at some point. So now, I, you've got to hear some amazing stories from people uh, that are writing you about this. Can you share some of the things you're hearing? We do. We do. It is, it is powerful. I mean, we had, we've had some little, I would call them mini conversions we had a 62 year old woman who texted us, emailed us actually over our contact page and said, I'm 62 year old Protestant. Is it too late for me to become Catholic? And um, we had a priest from Hong Kong, you know, who said, this is a beautiful piece of catechesis in such a short amount of time. And he talked about how he would be using it. Most recently, we had a, a gentleman email us and I sent this to everybody that was a part of the film because it was so powerful. And he said, um, you know, what you presented he said, I sat there and cried. And he said, I had to watch it over and over again because he said, this is what I've seen in mass. And to have you put it on film is, is correct. You know, and so, and we have met, oh goodness. Um, I've met personally 30 living, living people who have seen the veil removed. And of course they don't tell anybody, but when you start talking about it, 
and they know you're going to believe them, they come up quietly and humbly and share what they've seen. And so they see anything from, you know, their deceased relatives, angels, um, the saints, all the angels, saints. One lady told me that she saw um, Jesus on the cross and blood was pouring from his side into the chalice. You know, another lady said she saw Jesus in, you know, the priest in persona Christi, but it wasn't the priest, it was Jesus. And he came off the altar and gave communion out, you know? So, I mean, it's just lots of amazing stories that really helped um, confirm what was already written in the script for one, but mm -hmm. also it, it built my faith. And then I was able to share those stories and build the faith of others so that they realize this is a very real thing. And not only do saints see this, but in our time, contemporary people have seen the veil removed, you know? So you go, okay, so not just one or two people have seen it, like many people have seen it and they're not crazy, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's a beautiful experience to hear and know this. And little kids, like you said, your daughter, um, little kids love the idea that they have a guardian angel. I, there are a lot of little kids who don't know that anymore. That's been lost. And so, you know, I like to pull out my catechism and say, look at what it says here. And, and look in Revelation where it talks about your angel looking at you and God. And um, so when they learn that they have a guardian angel and then they see it in the veil removed, it, it confirms that they get really excited. I, parents come back and say, oh my gosh, my daughter's so excited to pray to her guardian angel to pray with her. And, you know, so it's very, it's exciting. All the different little nuances that the Lord is doing through this. Well, I know as a priest that watching it uh, again was, uh, just such a strong reminder never to take casually what we're doing as priests, you know, in, in the mass. And as, as I told you before the program, the chalice you're using, the, the veil removed is identical to the one I was given at ordination. And so every time I see that part, I mean, it, it is just such a powerful reminder of what we are doing, that we are in persona Christi, that, that this is, uh, a powerful work of God in the, in the midst of us. So yeah. as I think the thing that a lot of people find interesting, you know, these people that these kids, especially that are normally bored when they hear that time collapses, you know, what do you mean time collapses? Well, there's no time in heaven. And basically we plug into heaven, you know, so time breaks down and Jesus on the cross and Jesus at the last supper is a literal thing that's happening. If you could see the veil removed, that's what you would see. That's what's happening at our mass, you know, and then, I have a chance then to explain the fourth cup and how that works, you know, and, and they're just like, I, I've never heard that. And these are things that, you know, I'm older people are saying to me too, I've, I've never heard that. And I'm like, I didn't either, but doesn't it make the mass that much more powerful? And no wonder it's supposed to be the most powerful and is the most powerful prayer we can say. Really, truly powerful. <laughs> Matter of fact, we've had people, um, when I have gone around to raise money for this, especially, I would tell people, I'd say, when it is time for the priest to lift up the host, there's Jesus. Be sure to ask him for what's most important on your heart right now. Pour out your love to him. But, you know, this is the most powerful, amazing miracle that we have in all of history and all of time that ever will happen. So with that in front of us, why not ask for other miracles? We should expect other miracles, you know. And I have a friend who um, is in Africa a lot on mission. And she said, you know, in Africa, they don't have the medical systems that we rely on. And she said, people come to mass ask for, asking for healing miracles and they get them and they expect them because Jesus is there. And it's like, of course, he's the divine healer. Of course he's there, you know? And so when you go up and receive the body and blood, when the, the post is lifted, when the chalice is lifted, ask for the most important thing on your heart at the time. And, and so I have had people come back to me and say, you know, you challenged me to do that when you were fundraising. Yeah, I remember that. Well, since then, I, I started asking the Lord to bring my daughter back to Mass, and she's coming back to Mass. Or I was asking for somebody, you know, to marry my child, and they just got engaged. You know, I've been praying that since you asked. All of a sudden, they found somebody, they're engaged, you know, and, and then people come up and tell me I was praying for this, for this healing, and this that happened. And so it's like, wow. So as it's been so powerful for other people, I, I'm the blessed one to hear all of these miracles all along and see them all along, you know, so God's building up my faith all along too. And I'm, I continually amazed, continually amazed. Chris, you now have a board and a creative team behind this apostolate. What are some of the different strategies and ways that you're moving this program forward in different avenues of ministry? 
Sure, we have a marketing company um, behind us, H and H Digital, and um, they are amazing. They've been doing a lot of social marketing over Facebook and Instagram and um, all worldwide, actually, not just here. You know, because they could, they have a further reach, so they help us. We have a marketing director who works directly with them, and then um, so that that's that's a big thing that we're doing right now. We're also starting uh, quarterly webinars. So we had Father John Ricardo on a webinar where we um, gathered questions from the viewers and then we asked him those questions. We had about 20, I think we had 2,500 people watching from around the country. Wow. Um, our biggest groups were actually from California and New York. I found that very interesting, yep. especially in COVID. Um, so people are interested in that. We're also, um, we have a 30 day meditation guide that we share with people. The parishes are doing that. We have a retreat that is now, People are starting to buy that because it, um, you know, COVID's opening up again. So now people, it's an overnight retreat for parishes or retreat mm -hmm. centers. And right. um, there, we also have a study guide that we are trying to complete right now. Um, we're working with the bishop right now on that. So that is, uh, we, we started it and worked with some um, parishes around originally and they loved our study guide because it was easy to understand some difficult concepts. And that was our point. It's like, you know, most of the world doesn't understand high theological thinking and the philosophy that goes into, you know, maybe the seminary. So, you know, we thought let's let's bring it down to a level where everybody can understand it. So we have those resources right now. And um, eventually we have a goal in about a year of having a podcast like you guys and, and bringing in priests to answer some of people's questions, just our everyday questions that we don't, you know, fully understand about our faith in the Eucharist. Now, are these things available on your website for people that are watching or listening? Yes, they are. Um, if they go to our shop page, just if they go to the veilremove.com and go to the shop page, they'll be able to find it. And um, right now, our study guide, like I said, isn't available, but people are still buying it. We're like, it's not available yet. We don't know when it's going to be completed. And they're like, they're like, that's okay. Just send it to me when it's ready. So we're excited about that. People are behind it. We think the Holy Spirit must be showing us that he really wants it to get completed here soon. But the retreat you can find there, the, the meditation guide you can find there. And then um, our most recent webinar with Father John Ricardo is also available at our um, at the .com. They'll I think they, I don't know what part of the website, but they can find that probably under resources. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for asking. I'm we are there other, the Chris, are there now. other uh, video productions uh, on the horizon uh, for you and your team? You know, we've had a lot of people asking us that, and that has not been um, in our plans as of right now, but we've had so many people requesting and asking, and we're like, all right, Lord, you know, especially um, the other sacraments. Could we see a veil removed version of the other sacraments? And, you know, once you do the Eucharist, which is what all the other sacraments are oriented toward, you kind of go, well, you can't really top that. <laughs> but we've had so many people giving us ideas from around the country with, gosh, this would be so cool. And that would be so cool. And, and they tell us their veil removed experiences and other sacraments. And it's like, well, maybe. So I won't say no. Um, we, are, we are getting a new development person. We've never actually had a development person. I was the development person. But... I've got so many things going that I haven't done much development in the last year. Um, so we have a new development person that maybe that'll be possible someday. Pray for us because I think that would be really awesome to be able to do the other sacraments as well. Mm -hmm. And I know you've got prayer warriors that are working with you. Tell us about their ministry. This is a ministry of sacrifice. Oh, it so is. So in the beginning, when we realized, okay, this is a real thing that God's asking us to do. Just the first two weeks after the inspiration came out, you know, we were like, if we're going to do this, we need some prayer power behind us. So we just started asking family and friends. And our goal was to find somebody to pray at the top of the hour, just for a minute, or however long they wanted to pray, they get a rosary or a mass or, hey, Lord, we help the veil removed and be done. Amen. So that's all we asked them to do. And um, we were surprised because we weren't really intending to ask people to pray for us in the middle of the night. But we had people volunteer for 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, all the way through the night without us asking them. And so um, that was pretty amazing. And so for seven years now, we've had people waking up at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and, and they pray for us and they go back to sleep. It's um, a really powerful prayer of protection, I think, for the project and everybody involved in it. And now we have, that group has grown to about 70 prayer warriors. So that's another thing people can do for our project if they wanted to sign up and be a prayer warrior and 
be a daily daily prayer warrior for us. That'd be really helpful. So and donors, we can we always love donors. So we could do something <laughs> like another film. <laughs> we we're always looking for those small donors and large donors. Um, but yeah, that would be helpful too. Since you're letting me plug here. <laughs> yes, sure. Chris, a big part of our audience are Catholic educators and leaders uh, in our schools. Uh, what thoughts might you have for them on how they could use your resources um, and the video perhaps uh, to uh, in their schools, whether it would be with teachers or students? Do you have uh, some examples that you might be able to share? Sure. Well, probably depending on the age, you know, they, they could, all of them could take our resources and use them. Um, and they would, you know, could adjust it to their levels. Right now, the thing that we're really concentrating on is the 30-day meditation guide because it's pretty easy to understand. Um, it's, it's kind of the first step, I would say, of our resources. Pretty basic, but there's a stuff in there that most people don't know about the Catholic faith as far as the mass goes. You know, stuff like, did you know the angels are there? Or the saints are there? Um, do you understand, you know, the time breaks down? Just things like that. And so what you do is you read two short pages a day. And I mean, they're, you know, it's a small booklet. So you read two short pages a day for 30 days. And the hope is, is that by the end of the 30 days, you've gone to mass four times. And each time the mass experience improves for you because you understand it better. And so um, there are a lot of people that use the meditation guide over Lent for their parishes around here. And um, we're actually um, doing the same thing with, uh, eventually we're going to have it in Spanish. But I would say you could do that in a classroom. Um, our study guide, when it comes out, will be really helpful in a classroom. And um, what I think is probably the simplest thing for people to do, though, is show the veil removed and then break it down. I mean, talk about the saints. Talk about the souls of purgatory, because that's one thing we haven't talked about yet today. But there are these smoky figures with their hands waving in the air in front of the altar, and they represent the souls of purgatory. And that is, um, that's been lost. A lot of people don't know that the souls of purgatory exist. And they, as you guys know, they really need our help because they can't pray for themselves. We can pray for them. But one thing they can do is they can pray for us. And so, you know, that, that could be a unit on its own. You know, you could break it, talk about the souls of purgatory, talk about the saints, talk about the angels, talk about the mass, talk about the last supper and um, Jesus on the cross and that fourth cup idea. Why, why is that happening in mass? I mean, that for me was a new concept and um, really changed my mass experience. Talk about the, the Eucharistic miracles. I mean, there's so many things that you could bring into the classroom by just breaking the film down itself. But the thing that um, we have a lot of priests doing is they will take the film and they will show it before mass. And then they will talk about it in the homily and they'll explain some of those things to their congregations. Okay. And um, so that's probably the thing that we're doing the most right now, but that's something that a teacher could do as well. And we have some things that they contacted us on our contact page that we could send to them. We just send to them for free. We okay. also have, I'm probably gonna get in trouble for this, but we do, have, we do have free DVDs for places that don't have strong internet too, you know, so you, okay. they could show those in their classroom. If they couldn't, you know, stream it into their classroom, right. they could ask for a DVD too. So mm -hmm. yeah, okay. there will probably be more things for us on our website eventually, but right now those are the three, is the retreat, the meditation guide and the study guide. And the okay. study guide, like I said, is still, it's, um, we're coming out with a second edition right now. So it's not uh, quite available yet. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. I, I want to go back to one of the first things we talked about, and that was your awakening when you were in your twenties. And, and to be honest with you, the same thing happened to me. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't Catholic. I grew up in the Episcopal church, but uh, the same thing where I really, I went to church. I was an altar server, received the Congressional Medal of Honor as an altar server for having wax spill on my face. But, you know, it's just one of those things. But um, I never really found that that moment of encounter. And, uh, you know, you have a background in education. What would you like to say to our educators that are watching or listening about how to make an impact on the hearts of their students so they, they can catch a hold of the Lord early rather than have to wait? And, and have an encounter like you and I did. Do you have any words of wisdom or ideas? You know, that's an interesting question. I think the very first thing that I would say will sound really simple, but I would say go sit in a chapel with the tabernacle where the true presence is, where Jesus is, or in front of the Eucharist in adoration for five minutes. Um, and, and if you sit there longer, wonderful. But 
there's something, and I would say probably 15 would be ideal, but there's something about just sitting there in silence. Don't, you don't need to tell the Lord everything. He knows everything. You don't even need to be listening, but just be with him and let him kind of saturate you. And the more you do that, the more the Holy Spirit begins to lead you. Um, but then from there, I would say, educate yourself. There's two books I would highly recommend. And one of them is called The Jewish Roots of the Eucharist by Brant Petrie. Very, very good book. Very good book. It really helps us understand the history of our Catholic faith and our Jewish brothers and sisters and how we're all tied together. And then um, the fourth cup, and that's regarding the mass. The Lamb's Supper, I mean, you really have to know the Lamb's Supper too, but a lot of what you learn in, in the Jewish roots of the Eucharist is in the Lamb's Supper. That's why I kind of jumped to the fourth cup. But the right. idea of the fourth cup is so, um, so amazing. And, and if, do we have time to talk about that? Or sure. Father, have you shared that? No, I, I think it would be really good. Why don't you share just a little bit about what you learned about the fourth cup because this as a part of the passover is such a significant thing for us uh as we experience the mass it is and so what i usually do when i talk about this is i take people back to the passover so the jews are in um you know in egypt and they're getting ready to leave egypt they've been given permission to leave and so the last thing that they're doing though is they're waiting for the angel of death to pass over their houses and in the meantime they're eating an unblemished roasted lamb, bitter herbs. They have to drink four cups of wine. And when they finish that fourth cup of wine, there's a narrator, there's a gentleman who's kind of telling everybody what to do with the meal. And um, when he finishes that fourth cup of wine and they've all drank that fourth cup of wine, he says, it is finished, which means the meal is finished. And now it's our turn to, we get to leave the promised land and leave slavery behind. And then we get to go to this amazing place, the promised land. So that's the Jews. So every year after that, the Jews had to um, reenact the Passover meal, which they always believed that they were actually with the original people at Passover. So it wasn't like they were remembering linearly. They were in that same time with the other Jews from the first Passover. So fast forward to Jesus, he's at the Last Supper and he's, he's celebrating the Passover meal. And so at that Passover meal, there's no lamb. But Jesus says, I am a lamb of God, right? And one thing that you'll notice in scripture is that they too have cups of wine that they're drinking. But at the Last Supper, they only drink three cups. They don't drink a fourth cup. They only drink three. And on, then they go to the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus gets whipped and he um, carries his cross and he goes to the, he's crucified. But from the cross where he's being crucified, he says, I thirst. And so somebody gets sour wine, puts it on a sponge and lifts it up to his mouth. He takes a drink and he says, just like the leader at the Passover meal, it is finished, mm -hmm. which I think is so beautiful because just like the Jews who they said it is finished and they were leaving the slavery of Egypt behind to go to the promised land. Now, because Jesus said it is finished from the cross, he allows us to leave behind the slavery of sin and allows us to go to our promised land, heaven. I mean, amazing. So you have, when, you, when the veil is removed for people, they see Jesus at the Last Supper and on the cross because those two points in time have to be brought together in the Mass, making right. the Mass so powerful. And, and I remind people over and over, Jesus is real. You are really at his crucifixion. There is no time in Mass. You're really at his crucifixion. You're really at the Last Supper. He's opening heaven for us, letting us leave behind sin. It's such a powerful moment. And if you're somebody who likes time warps and know that it's a real thing in the mass, yeah. <laughs> it makes it really cool. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the parts of the Eucharistic prayer is called the anamnesis, yes. uh, which means remembrance, but uh, it's not a remembrance like a Kodak moment, remembering back to the good old days, but it's just what you said. Anamnesis is bringing the past into the present and it becomes for us at that moment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the Jews call that Zikaron, and, and I'm going to ask you, Father, will you say that again? Because I've heard it pronounced anamnesis and anamnesis. Yeah, oh. I say, I've, I've heard it say both, said both ways. I usually say anamnesis, and I don't know okay. why. Okay. <laughs> Our team is always like, how do we say that again? <laughs> so yeah. I'm going to take your, your pronunciation. Yeah, but it's interesting. Um, it's used also as a medical term, as an anamnestic response. Oh. And that's when you have 
a bee sting. And if you are allergic to a bee sting, the second time you get stung, your body remembers the first sting. Oh. And so it's like a double hit. And so each time you get stung, your body remembers the previous. So it brings the past into the present. And I thought that was an interesting illustration. Well, that's what vaccines are supposed to do too. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so when we are in mass, every time we go to mass, it is an amnestic response. We are brought not only to that moment, but to every moment we've been with Jesus, which to me is just powerful. So powerful. So powerful. Matter of fact, um, I would, I would recommend people if they want to hear a full experience from somebody, their veil removed experience. There's the lady that I was talking about earlier. Her name's Catalina Rivas, R-I-V-A-S. She lives, um, I believe she's in the Yucatan in Mexico now. Um, she's got the stigmata. You know, she wrote the booklet and, and has an imprimatur from her bishop to write it. They you know they've proven she's not mentally ill, you know, but she has a lot of experiences. She has the gift of locution. So when she was seeing this at mass this one time the holy mother and jesus were telling her explaining what she was seeing so you get that explanation along with what she saw it's amazing wow. it's an amazing little booklet yeah yeah I, I usually give those booklets out when i go speak but they also have them in spanish as well i think they have them in a lot of other languages actually but that, that's a powerful account of of the veil removed that a lot of people and because it also explains what they're seeing what she was seeing that makes it really special yeah. You did a great job, Chris, explaining uh, the, the fourth cup uh, kind of paradigm. And I could see why the, the veil uh, removed could be helpful during Lent, you know, particularly around Good Friday when folks will reflect on the seven last utterances of Christ um, with, with it is finished being, mm -hmm. being the final um, and, and the deep symbolism and uh, that, that those three words carry, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I do have to share one more thing because you guys are asking about how to help kids. Um, a lot of times kids will glom onto a song that they, uh, they like the sound, but they don't, they don't know what the words are. And sometimes the words are not so appropriate. So we have a, a young group who just created two songs that talk about the veil removed. And one of them is called Now I See. And the other one's called, uh, I shouldn't be telling you, it's, it hasn't come out yet. The second one hasn't come out yet, but it talks about heaven and earth collide. And, and, it, and those songs, when they come out, that group, their name is um, JMMJ. And they're going to release both of those songs uh, around Pentecost. So that would be something that, you know, you could play the music and, and let the kids listen to it in, in the classroom and say, let's talk about this. What, what do you think all those lyrics mean? You know, kind of thing. And yeah. um, so that those would probably be good ways to introduce it in the classroom as well. Yeah, the, uh, I know the Eastern Orthodox love to talk about the divine liturgy or the mass as the place where heaven and earth touch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that is, that's super. Yeah, and you know, if you go into a lot of the Eastern Orthodox churches, they're the paintings on the walls, you know, with all the angels and all the saints, just make the veil removed so apparent. Yeah. And they're so colorful, which I'm a, I'm a big color person. So I appreciate the beauty of those churches. And, and the beautiful thing of their spirituality is those icons, they, they consider them windows. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, you're not looking out, you're actually looking into heaven. So those are windows into eternity. It's just a, it's a marvelous wow. thing. Wow. Yeah. Beautiful. Wow. One of the things that I like to teach um, young students as well is that I have a, it's interesting how this project brought people into my life with special gifts. And I have four people in my life now <laughs> since being in this project, beautiful people who have the gift of locution. And um, one of them was praying for the project one time. And she said, the Lord wants me to tell you to tell young people that when you receive him, he gets into every cell of your body. And I thought, wow, you know, so there's a powerful reminder that he can heal us. Um, and there's, there's a powerful reminder that you've had this, I always say this nuclear bomb of holiness that just hit your body, <laughs> you know, so it's a, it's a powerful um, thing. I think kids really embrace that to have that imagery and to realize that it's not just an imagery, it's a truth, you know, not just a mm -hmm. metaphor for what happens to us. Yeah. The timing of this message and episode, Chris, is is 
timely, uh, given where we are with the pandemic, right? And I'm thinking of folks' mass going habits have altered. You know, there are still some churches shut down in places um, in, in the world and, and in our country. And so I hope that what you're sharing and this project and folks going to see the video uh, will inspire folks to return um, and, and, and for bishops and others to, you know, advocate for the opening of, of our parishes to their capacity um, and for us to kind of get back to normal. Um, yeah. We need that spiritual nourishment uh, that comes only through the Eucharist. Our bishop here in Iowa has opened our parishes up. All of our pews can be right. full now. Uh, well, we do distance within the pews from families that aren't ours, but they're pretty full now, which is nice. Um, but that reminds me what you're saying, Kyle, is, you know, when we take Jesus out, we are supposed to be his hands and feet. We talk about that a lot. And we, you know, Jesus comes down to us this way in mass, but we're supposed to go out this way horizontally. And that's important to remember. But one thing that I think is so powerful is we, we take out a light in us. And even if we don't do anything, he's still out there in the world making a difference. And so, you know, you think of when all the masses shut down and how the world kind of went crazy. It, it makes sense. We didn't have the balance of good and evil going on because there wasn't the good being taken out. So it's, it's real motivation for a lot of people when they realize that, that, oh, I just have to take him out and God makes the difference. You know, I had one gentleman say just two weeks ago, I ran into him. He was a gentleman from Colorado and he was telling me how much he loved his film and how he had a veil removed experience when he was in high school. And he was, he was a person, he said, I hated the mass. I wasn't Catholic, but I was going to Catholic schools. And he just went on about how he was in the wrong place at that time, but he went to a retreat and uh, he had the veil removed for him. And when he went out of the church, he said, I saw the people that were in the state of grace because they had this glow of Jesus in them. He said it was amazing. And so, you know, we don't see it all the time, but there are those rare few like him who are able to see how when we receive Jesus in grace and we take him out, what a difference we can make. And he said, there's a literal light of Jesus that we walk out with and make a difference with. So yeah, we can do that for our world. So many people feel helpless. What can I do? Go to mass and just take him out. Just take him out. <laughs> you know? I like that. It's a takeout order from the Lord. It's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah, I like that. I like yeah. that. I, I might let, use that. <laughs> let Christ work through us. Let yeah. us be his, his instruments and, and vehicle. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I have a priest friend that put a sign on the back of the church. You can't see it when you go in, but when you leave, there's a sign and it says you are now entering the mission field. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. It's just that's a great reminder great. again that we're taking Jesus out into a place that desperately needs him. Oh, especially now. Yeah. If, if more than any other time, probably in history. That's a good segue, Chris, to uh, the question that we've wrapped uh, each of our uh, episodes this season with, uh, with each of our guests. Um, and so here goes. Um, these have been challenging times, uh, particularly over the last uh, 12 to 13 months now, uh, from issues of racial tension to a global pandemic to arguably the most hotly contested presidential election in our country's history all making our society seem rather fragile. What message would you like to leave our listeners and viewers with? Know that Jesus is in control and he knows what's going on. He hasn't forgotten us. Um, he's not nervous. And I get that from Father John Ricardo who said that on a webinar we just recently did. He's not nervous um, and he is in control. And I, the best thing that we can do is choose him. And I would say that includes, you know, choosing the Eucharist, being in the word and um, learning about the power of the name of Jesus, because he said, um, you will do these things that I have done in greater. And so we need to understand that as baptized children of God and the power of Jesus's name and the Holy Eucharist, um, he can work through us and we can do a lot of amazing things, even in these times. It's a great message. Oh yeah. That, that's a great thing for us to uh, leave with our, our viewers and our listeners. And I, I just think you're right that we just have to put our eyes on him. You know, I think in Hebrews 12, that's what it says to fix our eyes on Jesus was the author and finisher of our faith. 
and he started it and he's going to finish it. That's right. Yeah. Along with the help of the Holy Mother. <laughs> yes. Oh, you can't forget her for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Chris, we want to thank you so much for being with us today. This has been such a rich, rich time. And um, I know I have watched The Veil Removed multiple times. I know there's going to be more. And for those that have not seen it, again, where can they find it? I think they can find it right on your website. Right. TheVailRemoved.com. And they can also look up The Veil Removed on YouTube. Um, I'm a little hesitant to send people that direction because I want them to be able to get into the further learning tools that we do have available. So I say go to TheVailRemoved.com and you can see all of the different translations there. You can also find them on YouTube though too. If, if you mm -hmm. for some reason are a YouTube lover, become a YouTube subscriber um, on TheVailRemoved.com too. And then we can tell you about different webinars and things that happen too. But TheVailRemoved.com is probably the best place to go. Okay, great. Thank again for, for just being with us. And uh, for our viewers and listeners, if you haven't already done it, please be sure to subscribe to our podcast and leave a comment. Encourage us toward our future programming. Uh, also, we want to thank our production interns, John Sampson and Alex Shire, along with our production supervisor, Mr. Jack Alsbach. And together, they do all of the production of this podcast. So thank you, and may God bless you. We'd like to thank you for joining us on this episode of Follow to Lead, a production of the Duke and Altum Schools Collaborative. To learn more about finding your own path in your journey of faith, or for more information on what we discussed in today's episode, you are invited to follow us on social media and visit us on the web at diaschools.org. To provide a one-time donation or monthly pledge, please visit our website. Your gift will aid us in providing up-to-date information, additional resources, and other support on how to take Catholic education to a higher level. We look forward to helping you follow God's call to lead others to God right here on Follow to Lead. <laughs>